Yeah, well, there are of course several sorts of measures, but I think one that is uh, very perhaps even simple to implement and, and also quite efficient, it has been shown, is to, um, to, to warn the population in the proper way. Uh, and to, to make sure also that um, the most vulnerable, vulnerable people like elderly or isolated elderly persons, they also get a proper warning about uh, a heat wave that is about to, to arrive in, in a given city. Um, these are so-called heat health action plans. Uh, and as I said, there have been studies in the past that show that um, if you implement, implement such a plan, uh, that you can reduce the number of, of fatalities occurring uh, during a heat wave. So I think that's a simple uh, measure that any city can take um, and that is quite efficient probably. We call it a, a local climate model. So uh, you know there are global climate models and regional climate models and these are being used uh, for the reporting of the IPCC for instance, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, but these large-scale models they they are too coarse, they do not contain enough detail uh, to allow to really say something about cities, or at least the, the microclimate occurring in cities is not contained in those models. And so ERBCLIM is a model that takes uh, results from such a global or regional climate model, but adds then an, a lot of detail at the, the city level. Uh, and to give you an idea of the, the level of detail, we, we typically uh, conduct simulations because it's a computer simulation model. We conduct simulations with a spatial resolution of the order of 100 meter. If you compare that to like global climate models which have resolutions nowadays of around 100 kilometer or even the regional models with resolutions of 10, 20 kilometer or so, you can imagine that at, if, if you have like photographic pixels of 100 meter resolution of a given area, an aerial photo let's say, uh, you can imagine that the amount of detail you get at 100 meter resolution is much higher than uh, the resolution you get typically in these uh, global and uh, regional models. Um, so ERPCLIM is, is a computer model, it's, it's a set of mathematical equations that is solved numerically, etc. Uh, and what it says about climate change, at least in the, the simulations we have been doing, uh, well first I should perhaps say that if, even if you just look at current day conditions, and you simulate an urban area with the ERPCLIM model, uh, then you typically find that uh, the number of heat wave days occurring in the city is typically a factor two or three higher than the uh, number of heat wave days in the areas uh, surrounding the city. So that is because of the urban heat island effect. And this urban heat island effect is uh, yeah, accounted for in the simulations of, of the ERPCLIM model. Now in the, in the longer run, if you really look at climate change and, and projections of future climate and all, uh, we've been doing exercises there as well uh, with the ERCLIM model. So we, we run the model under conditions typically of the end of the century, for instance, and we take down one of the IPCC scenarios for that. Uh, and if you go to, let's say, one of the stronger IPCC scenarios at the end of the century, we find in our simulations that the number of heatwave days would go up by a factor of 10. So from, let's say, a few days uh, today in, in current conditions, up to more than a month at the end of the century. This does not mean that this is one single month. It could be like five or six heat waves, each with maybe five or six days of, of heat wave conditions. But still, we see that there is a, a very big increase of the number of, of heat wave days uh, with climate change. Uh, it depends a bit what you're looking at. I mean, like agricultural areas and, and uh, the crop production there is also very vulnerable and that sort of vulnerability is not there in the city. But generally it's, it is uh, assumed that cities are vulnerable specifically because they, um, they contain a high concentration of all sorts of things, of people to start with. So there are many people living in cities and they're all then exposed to a different microclimate. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure, and critical infrastructure also in cities. Uh, lots of roads also, uh, railway tracks. Um, lots of office buildings with like IT infrastructure which does not uh, withstand excess heat and they have cooling and all. But I mean there's a lot of, of sensitive infrastructure also in cities. Uh, and then there is of course, I mean, a big share of the economy from any country I think 
takes place in cities and so uh, that can be quite strongly affected as well there uh, in, in these cities. So yeah, I think these are a few aspects that make cities more vulnerable. And may, yeah, if may, another aspect which I did not mention, it's again related to human health, is that um, we know that often in cities uh, there are more elderly people living there and very often also in isolation. And so from a health perspective, I think cities are also the people living in cities are perhaps more vulnerable on average than the people living on the, on the countryside. <laughs> it's a bit hard for me to answer because I did not check the, the simulations. We have been doing simulations for Barcelona uh, and I know they also are in this category of an, an increase by a factor of 10 of the number of heat wave days and all. Um, 2030 is also not very far away, eh? so I would expect that the situation will not be too drastically different from now. But uh, in all the simulations we do, be it for Barcelona or, or other cities uh, in Europe, uh, we see that there is this continuous increase of, of the heat stress. Uh, it goes slowly but very steadily also. And so in 2030 the effect may still be uh, limited. In 2050 it will be quite a bit more already. And by 2100 it can become really dramatic if, if the climate change as it is happening now, continues without any more measures, then it will be really quite dramatic, I think.